you for the reminder. Great. Awesome. Okay, I'll say it again then. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tara Cooper. I'm the director at the Johnson Public Library in Hackensack. I'm here with my co-chair. I'm doing this as if you guys have her right next to me, but Jenny, you want to introduce yourself now? Sure. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jenny Poo, director of Hoboken Public Library. Happy to see another Hoboken night here. Hi, Molly. And I'm uh, the co-chair of the LAMP committee and just so happy to be a part of this great program. So do I turn over to Dave now? Or Darlene? Yes. Uh, well, I guess, yeah, we should introduce Dave, right? So if you haven't yes. had the chance to meet him yet, virtually or in person, um, Dave Hansen is with us, the executive director of Buckles, and he's going to say a few but he's always so inspiring no pressure dave he's going to inspire all of you and then we'll get started with the program so take it away dave well good morning it's great to be with you uh we're so excited so many people showed up to do something called a professional development and you should know that buckles is a group we believe in many many things but part of our mission statement is actually that we share professional development that's what we do and we are very serious about it. There are many wonderful programs that you can take advantage of as being part of this consortium, just like today. And, and I thought I'd just share a, a little bit of a story. You know, I know this is about where you're going and the different career paths that you've got there. I should let you know, I never set out to be a director. It was really not a thing I was ever going to do. I was very happy to be uh, a senior administrator for library systems. That's really where I thought I would be. And then along my journey, I discovered this wonderful place called Buckles, where it was really a back office situation to be a director. And it just worked out that way. So as you sit here today and you're thinking about your career, I want you to remember libraries are amazing places, but we're only amazing places because the amazing people who work here make them so. And so as you are looking at what you want to do in life and what you were looking at, what you want to do in libraries, listen to the amazing people who are about to be answering your questions because they come from a variety of backgrounds. They do an amazing amount of things, and they've probably been exactly where you are today. So have a great day. Enjoy and ask all the questions you possibly want to. Thank you so much, Dave. We also have Darlene with us. Darlene um, keeps Jenny and I on task and helps make all these events run smoothly. Did you want to say hello, Darlene? Oh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining <laughs> us. I think we have a great program with a lot of great um, panelists and a lot of great questions. Thank you. And thank you to Darlene for helping keep everything organized and setting up all of the logistics for us today. Um, so we're lucky enough, first of all, I'm very excited that this panel is all women. So girl power panel today, I'm very excited about that. Um, I see three of our four panelists is, I don't see Maria worth joining us yet, right? Oh, there you are, Maria, I didn't see you, I'm sorry. It's okay. I'm sorry, Maria. Okay, well, it's I'm okay. gonna put you on the spot then and introduce <laughs> you first. Why don't you just um, say good morning and your, and your library and we'll introduce all the panelists and then we'll start with you each one at a time. But go sure. ahead and say hello, Maria. Sure. Sorry. Good morning, everyone. It's okay. No problem. Good morning, everyone. My name is Maria Wirth, and I'm from the Cliffside Park Public Library, the assistant director there, uh, and I work with uh, Stephanie Bellucci. Awesome. Right there. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda, would you just say hello in your library, please? Sure. I'm Amanda Eigen. I'm head of library services for Maplewood Library. Great. And coming at us from the Commonwealth of Virginia, my former colleague at Richmond Public Library. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Nandita Agaram. You can call me Nan. My, my name is like a mouthful, so uh, you can call me Nan. <laughs> um, I work at Richmond Public Library in Richmond, Virginia, and I'm the technology coordinator here, which is Thanks essentially so a systems librarian. Thank you so much, Nan, and thank you so much for joining us from Virginia today. And last but definitely not least, Lori, do you want to say hello, introduce yourself? Hi, I am Lori Steinbacher. I am the fairly newly minted director of the Ridgewood Public Library. Thanks, Lori, and congratulations again. Um, so, Jenny, we're normally we just we we have each of the panelists talk a little bit about their uh, their background, where they got to where they are now. Um, what they would do differently, if anything, uh, what they wouldn't change. And after 
everyone goes through their little career path history, then we'll open it up to questions. I know some of you submitted questions in advance and we'll hit those first and then we'll just open it up to general Q and A. Um, so I'll, any, any of our panelists wanna go first? Um, Tara, did we introduce Maria? Did I miss that? Yeah, we got I, Maria, yeah. Yep. Okay, just making sure, good. Yep, yep. Yeah, was thank you. So I, like I, pro I, I propose if we can go in reverse order of the way we introduced everyone. Okay, cool? sure. So then Lori, it's, you're up first, if you don't mind. Okay, Thank you. Sure. So um, I've been a librarian about since 2010. So that's um, what, 13 years. Uh, I like to think of myself as a late in life librarian. Um, I came to librarianship late. I didn't start library school until I was 40 years old. Um, uh, before that, I had a career in retail, um, which I feel has uh, given me an edge um, when I've applied for jobs um, in the library world. Um, and it's helped me immensely in um, my current position because um, especially when you, every single person who works in a library um, who is, is uh, customer facing is a customer service professional. Um, so retail really helped me with that. I also spent a little bit of time in advertising and just before I became a librarian, I um, ran college bookstores for a number of libraries, uh, for a number of colleges in the uh, New Jersey, New York area. So I had some book experience and some retail experience that sort of brought me to um, librarianship. I started as a part-time library assistant in Allendale. I worked with Tara there. Um, and then um, from there, I transitioned to a, a full-time non-professional um, head of circulation. Um, my next job after that, I went into uh, the head of, I was the head of circulation at Ridgewood and there's where I've spent the rest of my career working up from head of circulation to um, assistant director to director. Um, if you ask me what my favorite job was, it, it would be head of circulation. So if there are any circulation heads out there or adult services heads, that was probably what I would say my favorite job. And if I could could have done that forever, um, I might have, um, which isn't to say that I don't get great satisfaction from being a director. It's just when you become a director, different things become your priority. So um, so you, you sort of get less of the day-to-day -day good with the public and more um, more building, more paperwork. So um, just as you're considering your own careers, I, I would encourage you to think about what you really love about being uh, in, in a library setting and lean into it. Um, I've told people before, not everybody needs to be a director or should want to be a director. There are so many satisfying things to do in the library that you could, as as I just said, lean into your strengths. And um, my, I have two pieces of advice and they, they seem counterintuitive, but um, the first is find your niche, like decide where you can really make a difference by working in depth and like develop that as part of your brand, right? So mine was um, discussion groups, started with books into films, into other discussion areas. So I leaned heavily into that um, so that people could recognize me as an expert at, at this particular thing. And then the other piece of advice would be um, sort of counterintuitive branch out. Um, if your aspiration is to be a director, then, you know, listen in, ask, ask about the building, uh, look at the things that your director does or your supervisor does and see if they're willing to talk to you about it. Um, and in that way, the more you expose yourself to things, the more you'll find out what your, um, what your passion is and what your real interest is in librarianship. So that's my spiel. Find a niche and, and also be as broad as you can. Thanks, Lori. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so totally different uh, career path. We're gonna go to Nan now, if you're ready, Nan, at Richmond Public Library. So 
maybe talk about um, your current position, but also how you got to that point would be great. Hi. Um, and any and any advice you have? Sorry. No, any off. advice I have. Okay. Um, I came into, like Lori said, I came into libraries late in life. I was, um, I got married and came into this country. So I was on a dependent visa. So I couldn't work for a long time. So by the time um, I could work and I started out um, at the bottom. So I was a page at Henrico Libraries um, Systems, Henrico. Um, and um, that, that was a part-time job. And after that, I started off full-time as a library technician, library technician two. Uh, then I decided to do my MLIS and which I did completely online at um, South Carolina. And my first librarian job was working with Tara. So she was my, we started on the same day and that was at Appomattox Regional Library Systems. Um, that was a regional library. So it is a bigger library system. Um, there, I started off as doing a uh, main in charge with programming, and which was not my niche, which I discovered very soon that it was not my passion, that I didn't care for it. And I accidentally fell into technology because our, the person dealing with technology left, and we were helping out our director managing the system and everything. And that's how I kind of learned on the job um, how to be a systems librarian. So when I then from there, I moved to um, Richmond Public Library five years ago, which was a little bit closer to home because the commute was killing me. It was more than an hour one way. Um, and um, I followed our director, who was a director who had been the director at Maddox, and he's now the director here. Um, and I've been in, I started off here as digital services librarian, and it's been kind of three years. Right before COVID was when I started as the systems librarian, or as we call it in the city, it's a technology coordinator position uh, for the system, for the whole system, Richmond Public Library. Um, and uh, it's been suddenly been an interesting learning position because the week after I joined, we shut down for COVID. I did not know anything. Um, who to contact, I did not know. So I had to rely on people who had been working in the system for a long time to find out who to reach out to do the things. Um, so that it's been certainly been an interesting journey. And um, I agree with my, what would be my, I would say try out everything that you can, because sometimes you think you don't know till you try that position. So my uh, advice would be to, if you like something, go try it out. If within the libraries, I'm sure we always short staff. So if you offer to help out in some position, we're never gonna say no. So go try it out and maybe you like it or maybe you won't, but go please go try out every position that you think you might be interested in and that would help you figure out your career path. Thanks, Nan. And just a moment of explanation for us, because a lot of us are Buckles people or North Jersey library people. So Richmond Public Library is a standalone system with, it's still nine locations right now, okay? Main library and eight branches. Um, so Nan coordinates all the technology for that whole system and works with the city's uh, Department of Information Technology. When Nan started at that department in the library, it was still called automation. So to just give you an idea of like, what she was coming from. So she's being very humble, but she's really done a lot there. But thank you for sharing that experience, Nan. Um, welcome. So I, I think, uh, Amanda, if you're ready, if you'd like to tell us your story and share any advice, thank sure. you. Sure. Good morning. Um, I've always loved this panel. Um, I've been um, a participant in the um, on, in the audience, and now it's nice to be um, on this side. I think it's great that they that it's been opened up to non-directors because, um, as I think it, both Lori and Nan have said, that there's um, all and Dave said that there's a lot to librarianship that isn't involved in being a director. So, um, anyway, I am head of library services for Maplewood. I um, went to library school initially thinking that I wanted to be a school librarian. I worked part-time in children's services 
at Summit Public Library, and then I was an elementary school librarian, um, and it was not a good fit. I really did not like the autonomy of it. Um, you know, I it was difficult to, um, the collaboration piece was there, but it wasn't quite the priority that I had envisioned it would be. Um, so I took a break, I was home with my kids, and then um, I started very, 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 very part-time at Maplewood in 2004. Um, I would say that timing has played, um, you know, and, and a little bit of luck with the timing have been on my side throughout my career. Um, but I've al also always been looking. And I think that that's something that in librarianship, we're not really, we're not really trained or kind of, um, maybe it's different now, but I never, I never was given that sort of idea that there's a whole world of librarianship out there and you won't learn about it unless you kind of seek it out. Um, I also um, didn't really develop strong mentorship until I came to Maplewood. So that's another thing, seek out people that you really connect with professionally, and and a little bit personally too, and and um, you know, librarians are by nature very very generous. Um, we love to share information. We we love to share our ideas, and I think that um, I've been very fortunate to be around people in the field who um, have have modeled that for me, and I enjoy passing that on and paying that forward. Um, I think as you move through your career, I agree with what Nan and Lori both said. You know, I think um, the, try things, and and there are there's a lot more movement and freedom now than there was when I first started. When I first started in librarianship, um, you know, Cirque was over here, librarians were over here, and it was a really strong and very unwelcoming hierarchy. And I think it's a very pleasant shift that we've seen away from that. I think some libraries still cling to it. Um, but one of the things that I love about Buckles also is that um, there's a lot of sharing of information. So, um, uh, and it also offers opportunities to get out of the building. Um, which I think is essential to kind of growing your um, skill set and your knowledge base and seeing how other libraries do things can only inform what you have to bring to the table. Um, and I mean that in the most sincere way, not in a competitive way. Um, so, um, and um, I guess what I, I should just say quickly, what I do at Maplewood is um, I oversee adult services and circulation and um, collection development technical services. So um, there's um, a lot of dual reporting that goes on and I work closely with the other department heads in, in, with that, in, in that aspect of it. And then I have um, direct reports who report to me. Stop there. Great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amanda. All right, last and definitely not least, I apologize for not seeing you earlier, Maria. <laughs> um, but Maria from Cliffside Park will speak next. Thank you. No worries. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I hope I can share some uh, a little bit of a different perspective from the other ladies, and that will hopefully um, just give you another avenue as well. I am actually different than all three in the sense that I went to school for uh, journalism and communications. I worked in television for um, seven or eight years, and it's a very cutthroat business. I loved it. I loved everything about it. I still love it to this day. Um, but it is, it's a tough field to be in, especially if you want to be a parent. And my husband's also in that same field. So having two people in that field and then trying to be a mom just wasn't working. And at the time um, I decided to change career paths and I actually went back to school and became a teacher. So I actually um, got my teaching degree and taught language arts because most of my communications um, classes that I took in school were English based, you know, writing for television, writing for print, writing for magazine, writing for all that. So a lot of um, language arts skills. And so I taught language arts and I then went back to get my master's 
uh, and my master was in supervision and administration, uh, which is a broad, it was under the education realm, but it was more of a, a broad uh, master's degree that I ended up getting. Uh, and then I became a mom. Um, so I left the teaching world thinking that I might be able to uh, stay home for a little while. And then I ended up being presented with a part-time position when I had a six-month-old um, at North Arlington Public Library. Um, Stephanie Bellucci at the time, who's my current director, became that was her first job as a director there. And she asked if I wanted to um, work very, very part-time as a children's librarian uh, because I worked as a teacher. I had that part of it. I also taught reading and writing. So it worked well to be able to do story times and so on with the children because I had that experience. And it was literally like 12 hours a week. And it, uh, I said, all right, I'll do it. So it got me out of the house for a couple of hours so I could stay sane while I had my newborn. And um, it worked out really well. I ended up staying for six years um, and went up to 18 hours a week. So literally my entire time there, I was a part-time children's librarian and I loved it. Um, and then I, I, was, I needed more. I was looking for more. I wanted a, a full-time job at that point. My children were uh, in kindergarten. One was about to, was it leaving pre-K or whatever the case was. And um, I, Stephanie had ended up um, moving to Cliffside Park Public Library which so happens to be my hometown and where I grew up. So it's just amazing sometimes how the world just kind of brings things together. Um, she had already been gone from North Arlington. I had worked there without her for a few years. And a position opened up at um, Cliffside Park, which was for um, a communications and um, community outreach librarian, like a PR, like doing more getting into the schools, getting into the town, getting to um, get our, the word out about our library into the community. So I ended up going over to Cliffside Park, taking on a full-time job as um, the PR and out community outreach person. We made tons of connections, really brought ourselves closer to our um, mayor and council and just really had the library become a lot more known in our community. And I then ended up running all the programming for our, our library, booked all the programming from pre-K through seniors, um, booked it all, expedited it all. Of course, we had children's librarians and adult librarians that, that were there for the programs, but I did all that part of it. Um, and as I was working through those years, I've been at Cliffside Park now going on nine years. I just, my role just started changing because um, like all three ladies before me said, I put myself out there and I just tried different things. And I also volunteered to help a lot. So even though I did all the programming and because, and I, um, you know, went out to farmer's markets and back to school nights and so on and so forth. I also went to my director and I said, is there anything else I can help you with? Um, what can I, what can I do? Or I would just notice that something needed a little bit of extra help and I would just help with that. Uh, helped it, all the librarians that were working there. Um, and my role just naturally sort of changed where I just took on a lot more responsibility. I started um, running the museum pass program at our library, running, became the ESL coordinator, started running the entire ESL, ESL program that had, uh, you know, that still currently has a hundred plus, you know, students in it. So I just started doing things. And um, I think Stephanie recognized that it, it wasn't even that a position of assistant director opened up. I just worked myself into that, into a role that didn't even exist because of my, um, my willingness and my efforts. And that's not to, to um, you know, pat myself on the shoulder and by any means, please don't get me wrong. It's just a matter of saying that if you put yourself out there and try different things and do a story time or go to a farmer's market or run a, you know, an ESL program or whatever, it might get recognized. And um, Stephanie just uh, picked up on that. And I then started helping her with uh, scheduling and payroll and a lot of different things that took some of that 
pressure off of her as a director. And it just naturally became a role of, I'm doing a lot of work that normally she may end up doing if I wasn't doing it. Um, and she actually, not that she surprised me with it, but she actually went to the board and created, you know, and asked her permission to create a, a position of assistant director, which Cliffside Park never had. Um, and they approved that position and I was able to get a, a title change after eight years of being there. And I became the assistant director there. And I'm also the facilities manager. Uh, so like Lori was mentioning, she does a lot of paperwork, a lot of facilities management. So I, I do anything that has to do with the building, um, electricians, uh, plumbers, heating, carpeting, uh, deep cleaning, anything you can think of, I also do that. So the reason I mention all this is, and I think this might be the biggest thing that might ca catch everyone by surprise, I don't have an MLS. I don't have an MLIS. I have a master's in administration and supervision. And I was able to become, after 14 years of working in a library, a part-time children's librarian to an assistant director. Um, I can't become a director. I will put that out there you know, clearly for everyone that is in Buckles land. Um, there are bylaws that state that you do have to have an MLIS to become a director of a Buckles library. And I don't have that. Um, and, and I'm perfectly okay with that because I feel that I'm in my role, in a role that I love. Um, I feel like I've tried so many different things and this is, this is a great fit for me. I also have a fantastic partner and great coworkers and that helps a ton as well. So I hope I was able to share a little bit of a different way of getting into the library world, uh, without necessarily having the library degree, but using the actual degree that I have to, um, to the best of my ability for, for our library. So thank you for letting me tell you my story. I appreciate it. Thanks, Maria. Do you have a clone? Because I could really use someone to do all of the things you just mentioned um, for me at my library. <laughs> Half kidding. Um, thank you. That was great. Uh, great perspective. And you all had very unique paths to where you are now and it sounds like um jenny i think you should say it jenny and i were jenny sent me a message before and what did you say that you're the best bit of advice from everyone is well what i hear is a common thread is offer to help and be helpful what i'm hearing right. from Lori and amanda and from maria and definitely from um nan is to be curious what i hear was curiosity and yeah, I mean, I learned early in my career, very early on, before librarianship, was um, to offer to solve problems. <laughs> you will be mm -hmm. recognized because everyone, every organization has problems to solve. And if you can be that problem solver, opportunities will open up for you because there's nothing. And I've, I've taken that advice to heart. So thank you. I, I hear this thread. And I also hear like, I don't think any of us here, though panelists had set out to become, to be a librarian, right? From when they were an undergrad. They're all like, no. Right. And that's <laughs> what's so nice about this career is that um, it draws upon your experience as a journalist, uh, managing retail, definitely plus, 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 um, being able to learn on the job from Nan, right? Tech. And with Amanda, I, I love, because as a mom myself, starting very part-time, right? And then moving into this role and naturally growing it. So I will stop talking because we do have, I want to make sure we have time. We do have um, a number of questions that were submitted by attendees. Is that cool, mm -hmm. Tara? Can we get to those first? Yep. I just want to mention one more thing. Please. I'm sorry. Just um, about what Maria said about, uh, so we have a head of technology here in Hackensack. And that position exists because I had the right employee that deserved to be recognized as a department head um, because she basically worked herself and grew this role um, from being a technology librarian into grew it into a department. And she now has folks, you know, working for her under that under that Good leadership point. Point. Um, and libraries evolve. So I'm so oh, I'll get you one second, Amanda. Libraries evolved. So 20 years ago, did they, the folks at JPL think we're going to need a head of technology? They probably didn't. You know, there may have been other department heads that, um, or other departments that made more sense at that time, but library technology and library um, roles in the community are continually evolving. So 
like Jenny said, be the person to solve the problem. If you can get good at process improvement, if you can get curious about process improvement, you could you can do anything. Because like Jenny said, if you can put fires out and solve problems and you're willing to help and learn, you're, you can go anywhere you want to go. Amanda had her hand up. What did you want to say, Amanda? So just very quickly, I, I, I did not mention my previous life before library school, which was also in journalism. I was at abcnews.com ah. <laughs> prior to launch. And I did a lot of writing and editing there. And so one other thing that I would say is if you have a skill that you enjoy, don't be afraid to say, hey, can I take a stab at this? Or, mm -hmm. you know, I've been known to go to my director even before I was a department head and say, you know, I noticed that this, what's on our website isn't really what we're actually, what's actually happening or <laughs> there's language here that I think could tweak, that we could tweak. Can I take a stab at it? And, you know, I'm lucky enough to be in an environment where I have a director who said, sure, mm -hmm. you know, show me what you got. And and that really, you know, then I then I wound up doing grant writing and being a point person for policy writing, which I really do love. So um, don't be afraid to jump in with suggestions and offer and, that. And I'd follow that up with, if you are in an organization where you feel like you can't reach out and say, hey, I'd like to try this, or maybe it's worth considering finding an organization that will allow you to do that if you want to grow in your career. Because it's really easy for great people to become stagnant because they just hear no every time they have an idea, right? Everyone's nodding every time they have an idea or hear a suggestion. And sometimes you just outgrow an organization or, or a role and it's okay to, to move on from that. But I don't want to talk anymore because we have all of these great questions. Yeah, I'm sure questions. as our panelists, yeah. yeah, I'm sure as they told their stories, you may have thought of additional questions. So Jenny, do you want to take like the first two parts of that first question it's multiple sentences or do you want me to just jump into it um, yeah and at, so the time i'm look, make mindful of the time is 10 36 yeah. so it's, and some of the questions i think were kind of answered so why don't you go ahead and take those two, i'll take question number three but yeah go okay for that. sure if there's so, areas you think that we've already answered let's let's just hop over that because i think people here probably have questions for the panelists yes definitely so one of our attendees um submitted a multiple part question. I'm just gonna go through it kind of quickly because I think our panelists may agree with what I say, but if you don't, please jump in. What is it like working for Buckles as a full-time librarian? And what I would say is it varies a lot based on where you are. That would be my answer, but I don't know if our panelists have specific, I would just say no two days are the same. Depends a lot on your director and your specific position, but if any of our panelists want to add anything to that. Oh, Lori, go. Um, just quickly, it, it does vary from library to library. What I would say is depending on what library you are, if there may be a library that's very exclusionary and doesn't involve themselves with buckles, um, I would try to get involved at the consortium mm -hmm. level whenever you can. So if you have a chance to be on a committee, it's, it is a great um, development tool um, for your career, just to get to know other people in other libraries so that you can find a mentor or find a sounding board, talk to somebody about what you can do. Um, it helps to have a, a, a director in a library that's involved, but um, don't necessarily write off consortium um, participation if your library isn't welcoming to it. Okay, I'm not, great. I'm not sure if that question was also um, meant to be like, what is it like full time? Meaning, you know, are you working days? Are you working nights? Are you working weekends? Mm. Perhaps maybe that's what it meant. So if that's if somebody meant that part of it, I would say, um, you know, libraries. That's one of the most beautiful things about the public libraries that we're open, you know, six or seven days a week, and we are open late nights for people that do work different hours of the day. So. If you are looking to get into the library world at a public library in Buckles, and that is your question, yeah, I would say that yes, you you may have some evenings and some weekend shifts uh, that might be shared with other coworkers, depending on what role it is that you are coming into. Uh, I know directors that even work, um, you know, reference if they have to in the evening, or they'll work a weekend day if there's a special program or whatever. So. Um, 
it, it, it's not necessarily just a nine to five job. Sometimes it is uh, depending on your role, but sometimes it's not. So if you're coming into the library world and that's your question, yes, you may have to work different hours, days, shifts. That's a, a great point. And thank you for reading the question that way, Maria. But in the, I think for the sake of time, we're going to keep moving along and maybe we'll just take one or two answers from panelists going forward, if that's okay with everybody, just so we get through all of these. Um, the second part of that question was, is there a lot of turnover or people generally happy? I think that's pretty subjective too. It depends probably on where you're at, but I don't know if Amanda or Nan had anything. I know Nan, you're not in the Buckles library, but you're in libraries in general. Amanda, you want it? You had your hand up, Amanda. Sure. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know that those two are, um, you know, I think turnover can exist whether people are happy or not. I think what's nice it's always nice to me when I see people move around in Buckles land um, and take on new roles. And, and um, you know, I think sometimes like Tara was saying, things people can get, it can get stagnant. Um, I think seeing movement among, you know, within the consortium and among and within a library too is actually, um, that that's a good thing. I mean, I think when you have, um, you know, the, the great, what is it, the great resignation that we've been experiencing? <laughs> and, you know, when you have a mass exodus from a place that may or may not speak to what the organization can offer. But I don't know that that, um, there are a lot of different things that go into morale besides turnover. I think True. it needs to be that a library, um, nobody left. And everyone stayed where they were. And when I started at Maplewood, um, I was the newest person. I, I think there had been a couple of hires, you know, within the last year or two. But before that, there had been no new hires for 25 years. I don't. I don't. Whoa. Know. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe 20. But I don't. I don't know that that's a good indicator of people being happy either. So I don't know if that, <laughs> that answers the question. That's very true. <laughs> Right. Thank you. Nan, any comments on that one? I think the answer to the question if people are happy is all depends on upper management. It depends on if uh, the directors and assistant directors or deputy directors are um, open to listening for opinions, staff's opinions. So I think it depends on where you work. Um, and I highly suggest please don't stay um, if you're unhappy at work. There are lots of other places to work, lots of lovely library systems where they want people who are motivated. So please feel free to move on. And always, I would encourage people to constantly look for jobs, whether mm -hmm. you're going to take it or not. And my husband always tells, it's okay to go for interviews. It's just experience to know what other people are looking for. You don't have to take the job. You just attend interviews, apply for jobs to see so that you can add if you feel that you are lacking in something, that way you can add to your profile, get the experience in it, whether through like a professional certification, whatever you need to do to get it done. So um, so please don't stay if you're unhappy. That's <laughs> that's a thing Then you become bitter in, it doesn't help if you don't like coming into work every day, especially since ours is a customer service job. We meet people, it does flow over when in our interactions with the public. So I feel nobody should be unhappy at work. That's good advice. Thank you, Nan. Um, another part of this question was, what is it fair to expect as a starting salary with a library degree and one to three years of library experience in New Jersey? Um, I think the quick and dirty answer is most Buckles libraries follow the NJ sal the NJLA salary guide, at least for starting salaries, but I don't know if anyone else had specific um, comments on that, or if you all just agree with me, <laughs> or, I mean, that's a general guideline, but it really depends on, you know, which, which library and what they can afford to. And union, civil right. service, grids, guidelines. Yeah. Um, those it depends on, um, but I think NJLA is a good starting point. Um, and library salaries are public. Um, mm -hmm. What anyone you can you can look if you're applying for a job and you know who's currently in that job, you can you can see what they're earning. It's all very transparent. 
also see if you can get your hands on the buckle salary survey. I share it with anyone on my staff who wants to see it, but there's great information on there because you can also compare them similarly sized and funded libraries because there's going to be some variety within there too. I think maybe that answers that question. Um, also, next part of this question, does Buckles offer formal internships? Uh, not internships, but as Lori was saying, there are a lot of opportunities with committee work and other things to really learn about maybe areas that you wouldn't previously be exposed to. And new directors are also assigned to mentors. Um, I don't know if anyone else has anything to say about, there's no formal internship program, but there are opportunities to learn and grow with, you know, with committee work, um, task force work, and if you're a director with your mentors. I wanted to add to yeah. that. It's, it's not, um, can you, I'm sorry, Tara. Did I oh, there you are. Sorry. No, go ahead. Um, it's not, this question is, um, it, it's not typical in my experience for consortia to uh, coordinate internships across all the libraries. We're a consortium of 77 libraries, but certainly individual libraries would, would offer internships. So perhaps the person asking the question was, um, might have been considering that with like big systems would offer that, but we're all individual, like smaller systems. Um, if I'm incorrect, please someone correct me. <laughs> That's my understanding. I've, I've never come across a library system that had internships personally, but that doesn't mean that they don't exist. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm I just think saying it just that depends. That could be, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. But there are opportunities to network and to learn and grow through committee work and buckles for sure. Um, all right, I'm going to move on. Uh, this question states, I currently work in a public library, but would also like to try other areas of the profession. How? How do I, I think it, they meant to write, change focus when all of my experience is in the public library? Anyone want to take a stab at that? Any of our panelists? I mean, I guess maybe try to get a part-time job in a different kind of library or volunteer, be able to volunteer or take courses. I mean, I guess there are a few different ways. Jenny, you've worked in other kinds of libraries. Why don't you hop into that one? I mean, you answered it part-time gig. I've worked in art libraries, medical libraries, school libraries, research libraries, often at the same time. Um, I would, because I was curious, I worked late. And when I was at the Met, I worked, I picked up a gig working part-time, um, leading CERC, late night closing shift at Wild Cornell Medical Library. Um, so I, it, there's a lot of part-time gigs out there. And if you're curious, just apply it. Like Nan said, it's good, it's good experience, right? I had no medical background, but they needed someone who could run a circ desk and close a shift at like midnight. At the time I could do that. I said, sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> and it was interesting. And it was really interesting because I got questions from some residents, like with some medical stuff. And I got a great appreciation for how specialized that literature was and how out of depth I was. But as an aspiring librarian, I learned how to seek those answers out. So that's, I don't, others here have great wealth of experience, but that's been, I got into academic, um, same way, I got a part-time gig. Um, ironically, I had not worked in a public library. This is, this is my first job in a public library, <laughs> being a director, but I felt like personally, my, all my experiences really informed me and prepared me well for this job because I, I have a very nonlinear career path um, that led me here. And I, would, I think I would just add to like, uh, Jenny, I'm sure that you know what your strengths are, right? So identify what your strength is and sell that to a different, um, you know, a different area of library uh, work. You know, if you know what your strengths are and you can really play up to that, that can take you into almost any job, really. I totally and agree. I think, you know, just we we undersell ourselves so often in the library world. And I think, you know, we have skill sets that are very unique and extremely useful in the in, in, in any field. 
just like, um, you know, retail, you know, customer service. I think all of that is um, the work that we do is um, specialized, but also applicable. So mm -hmm. even just make a list of what your skills are and then, you know, make sure they're highlighted in your resume and take that wherever you want to go. And, and two more things, uh, network as much as you can, just in general, that's like go to conferences, talk to people from all different kinds of libraries from different parts of the state and network as much as you can, because you never know when a part-time job might pop up and they, someone may have you in mind if, you know, also I worked at, I was, I went to William Patterson for my, any of Willie people out there for my undergraduate degree. And, um, I worked at the college library at the university library and I, I worked there part-time after I graduated. And folks working at the everything but the reference desk, we had people from all walks of life. We had people that were like local folks from Patterson. We had students, we had graduate students. We had people who were full-time librarians at other libraries. So um, look on your state, like look at the, like if you're a local to North Jersey, Montclair, Empo, William Patterson, see if any of them are hiring for just part-time non-librarian positions. If you're interested in academic libraries, just so you can have an opportunity to be like have FaceTime with the librarians there and talk to them and see what it's about. Um, I worked till midnight at that library too, Jenny, and just closing the CERT desk. And it was a great experience. I got to meet a lot of people that way. So it didn't pay well at all, but it played a lot of experience. So, um, you know, you don't necessarily have to have a library degree or a ton of academic library experience to work one of those uh, clerical jobs in an academic library. So great, great advice. We have kind of a- Tara. Yeah, sorry. It just pops up. It just goes to show like on the um, on the chat, Amy um, from Livingston wrote like NJLA, PLA, ALA, there are yep. also opportunities, yep. you know, so that kind of goes along with what we're with, with what we're yep. saying. And there's just, just one question underneath that that maybe we could answer. Do you know where we could look at the Buckles salary survey? Yeah, it's I don't know where it's posted in Buckles Internet world, but your director has it. Ask your director for a copy of it. That's that would be the easiest. Yeah, exactly. All the directors have it. So ask your director for it. Um, if your director won't give it to you, email me and I'll send it to you. Okay. So anyway, um, <laughs> uh, right. Um, and we have kind of a multi-part longest question coming up that I'm going to let Jenny handle. So I'm going to give this one to Jenny and sure. we will have time for open questions after these next couple. So just, if you have a question mind, just hold on to it for now. Yeah. Go ahead, and I, I apologize earlier. I, I thought we were limited to one hour, but I was reminded, no, we have more time. Um, so good. <laughs> so this next question I'll, I'll summarize. Um, it was, um, the question was submitted in advance. Um, I'm a first generation student. I paid my way uh, through a bachelor's degree. It took me eight years taking one class at a time. I come from an underrepresented minority group. I'd like to see individuals like me achieve professional degrees. Would you happen to know of colleges that are willing to assist underrepresented groups with the full rider close to it or a master's degree of a master's of library science degrees? Are there other avenues to significantly reduce the master degree costs? I live in New Jersey, high cost of living. I'm only taking, I'm only asking since taking one class at a time is no longer feasible due to time constraints and finance hardship. Any information would be appreciated. Um, so I'm a big advocate of getting someone else to pay for your graduate degree, because that's what I did, because it's really, I see a bunch of heads nodding. Um, and the way, for, first of all, let me share out the resources that, you know, perhaps this person didn't know about. Certainly there are at the, there are scholarships at the consortia, state and national level. And I'm happy to say that there are more of these to encourage underrepresented populations to go into librarianship. So at you know, Buckles has a scholarship. Um, ALA, of course, sorry, the state and JLA has scholarships and model um, after the Spectrum Scholarship that is trying to specifically provided for folks from underrepresented groups. So those are like the three big ones. And of course, certainly there are other, many other scholarships out there. Um, how I got mine paid for was I worked for a, a large employer um, that subsidized, that offered tuition reimbursement as a benefit. And I was very, I was uh, intentional about seeking this out because I couldn't afford to pay grad school tuition. And in fact, I, there were two employers. Um, one was NYPL, 
which has a really well-established trainee program that pays for your graduate degree and pays a, a librarian salary, and then you're in the system. So at least three of my colleagues at the time went through that and are now either directors or managers or off, you know, having fabulous careers. I didn't go there. I worked for the Metropolitan Museum of Art, huge organization that has a fabulous tuition reimbursement program. So um, I got my grad degree mostly subsidized there. But I know a lot of folks here probably have other resources that they can share out. Um, oh, no, I will say at the same time, I did work a number of <laughs> jobs at the same time. Like while I was the Met, you know, I worked at the medical library and I went to grad school and um, I worked at MoMA. I worked at the Frick cataloging jobs where, like Nan said earlier, I learned very quickly what I sucked at, which was cataloging and hated it. But that was a process of elimination. I would not have known that had I not taken on those cataloging jobs. So I'm very thankful for those opportunities to fail and to learn what I wasn't good at. But that's how I think, you know, it's a great question because it's sort of like the big elf in the room. How do we pay for it? And um, I know more and more of our libraries are finding ways to, to pay for, you know, certainly memberships to our state organizations. Tuition is always a big issue. So I open the this to the others who want to add more resources to it, but um, that's been my experience. Even though I didn't get my MLIS, I have my master's, like I said earlier, I did the same thing though. So I went, um, I was teaching, um, I went, at the time I went to a parochial school. I taught at a parochial school because um, the restrictions were a little bit less than they would be in a public school. And I was able to go get my master's degree at the same time as I was teaching. And it was 50% um, um, tuition reimbursement, but Hey, I mean, 50% is better than full price. So I did the same thing. I got scholarship money through Rutgers um, every year. And um, when I applied, um, remember that when I applied like the, for the third semester, one of my professors, or I forget, I forget what her role was, but she kind of like gave me the, the, the side. I was like, you're applying for this again. And I was like, I'm, I'm, yeah, you don't have to give it to me, but I'm going to apply. <laughs> and they gave it to me. <laughs> um, so yeah, don't see, seek out whatever, wherever. And, and I worked also, I worked while I was, I mean, that's, I think also another great thing about um, libraries and we have, um, we had two, now we have one um, employee who works full time and is getting her MLIS and, um, you know, we support that if they need to do work, if they, you know, they need to do their schoolwork, like um, we wholeheartedly, you know, if they have to switch their schedule so they can go to a class, we support that. Um, I did, I was lucky enough to receive a Buckles scholarship, but I just like worked a lot. <laughs> like I had a lot of jobs. <laughs> I worked full-time in Allendale and part-time at Franklin Lakes um, and a little bit at Willie P. And I just cranked out my master's in 14 months, which I don't recommend anyone do, but I was just very motivated by the increase in salary. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it's, I, I will say, like for me, my degree is more than paid for itself. It was well worth it. I also did all that before I had a child. So I was able to like sleep five hours a night and stuff and it was fine. It would be significantly harder for me to do now. Um, but it sounds like just like everything we've talked about, there are a lot of different ways to do it right. You know, so you'll find, you'll find a fit that'll, that'll work for you. And you don't need to do your degree in 14 months. It could take you it takes a lot of people several years and to go very part-time and that's fine too. And thank goodness now with all the online programs, it's so much easier to, you don't have to build that commute time and to get down to Rutgers or out to Pratt or wherever you're going. So. And I, I would just say, 
Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, mean, I was going to say, I just dated myself by naming those two commutable library schools. That's all. Right. <laughs> uh, so one, one co um, another one, Darlene reminded me that some individual libraries may offer like smaller scholarships through their friends groups. That's uh, another avenue. Um, but I just had a thought and I forgot it because I want to make this comment. But um, yeah, I don't believe. Oh, yeah. Go for the cheapest accredited library degree at the time when I worked at the Met you know we had a contingent of like li li aspiring librarians who wanted to go to who went to Pratt for their art library um, track and I went to Queens College because it was significantly cheaper same degree I was already working in an art museum I didn't really need that track and um, my tuition reimbursement would have covered most of that, whereas with Pratt, I would have taken out additional loans. So sometimes people ask, does it matter if I go to what Illinois or some of these big schools? No, honestly, just get that. Yeah, paper. no you one know, cares. As long as it's accredited, no one will care. I would also yeah. say if you're still an undergraduate, it doesn't matter where no one has ever asked me where I got my undergraduate degree ever. A few people have asked where I got my master's, not that it really matters, but no one's ever asked where I went to undergrad. So if you're still getting your bachelor's, go to like the cheapest, easiest bachelor's <laughs> school you could go to, get it done, and then go to get your MLS done in the most affordable way. That's really good advice, Jenny, because it really doesn't matter as long as the program is accredited. Yeah, when I, and then someone here was, a we have a couple of former school librarians, I think Amanda, right, and Maria, and I also... <laughs> I also was, this, I am a certified New Jersey Library Media Specialist. I got that certificate and those classes covered by the district. So the dist, New Jersey, um, at least New Jersey and other states, they'll hire um, provisionally, right? Uh, a librarian, right? People here are nodding their heads. But once you're in the system, boy, I got a lot of tips from my fellow teachers of um, same thing I dropped. Rutgers had a path where I could complete the nine credits for like $11,000 versus going to sit in a classroom at St. Peter's College for a couple hours a week, and that cost a thousand. Obviously, I went with the St. Peter's route and I met other teachers. So, I mean, talk to other colleagues. I'm sure there are other ways of paying for degrees that you didn't know about that I didn't even know to cover. But yeah, so I'm get someone else to pay. Don't take out huge loans, please. Don't cripple yourself at the beginning of your career. It's also librarian skill, right? To research all these, these, these uh, see, I see Nan nodding your head. Yep, you got it. Like, if you're going to be in this career, um, whatever job you do, you know, we should be resourceful. It starts with ourselves. Excellent advice. Um, we had a, a suggested question from one of our wonderful panelists. Um, what steps did you need to take to get to the position you are in now? If one of our, some of our panelists have spoken about this, but if there's anything you want to add to your story, like Amanda just went back and revised her story to include her background in journalism. If there's anything else anyone would want to include about their origin story, that would be great. Yes, no? I think you covered most of it. Okay. Yeah, they did, they did a great job covering that. <laughs> and here's another one, a self-answering question, but still an important point to reiterate. Can you make it far in the library world without an MLS or MLIS degree? I think Maria told us her story and how she's made it up into upper management at this point with uh, an equivalent, I would say, master's degree, but not one that is specifically library science. There are library directors that also have an MBA or another sort of management degree. So um, it is it is possible, but I think the most common track for most people is an MLS or an MLIS degree. I will say nationwide, there is an increasing trend um, of big systems who are providing alternate routes because mm -hmm. we're having in our field, you know, we still have a lot of people who go into this field um, with this idea that it's going to be quiet, with still like the, the <laughs> outcomes of being librarian. Example in point, my colleague who is the CEO of the Cincinnati, Public, Cincinnati County Public Library System has 90 openings because at her because a lot of people don't want to manage and librarians who've been the roles. I know Nan's like, really? Yeah. And though they actually have demoted themselves to like, I don't want to manage a whole branch. So they're developing a whole alternate route certificate program because there is this huge need for people 
with retail management skills, with you know knowing how to run a program skills, with facility skills, who don't have an MLS, who want to run the day-to-day -day operations. So I think this will, I think there is definitely a route for people with non-MLS and that's that's driven by the market and the need and the changing demands of our field. MLS still will get you far, like, but um, I will say the CEO of Boston Public Library got that gig, he was an IT and he mm. took a job, he got laid off and took a job working at Boston Public overseeing their IT and is now the CEO. I don't know if he went back and got his MLS. I, I can ask him, but there are definitely routes you can go far without an MLS. And it just depends on your skill set. And, and I don't think academic less so. For example, I would never get an interview for, I mean, I was a dean at an academic library institution. And that was also a very um, opportune time. And I knew the institution. And sometimes it's about timing, but like, big the the was the r1 research one institutions like if you don't have a second master's degree it doesn't matter if i've run you know the biggest system they won't they won't interview you they there's like you know that culturally they they want someone with that that field so academic may be more limited i think to their detriment between us <laughs> but honestly because right running facilities is a very different skill set than running a, than uh running some like a children's program or maybe there is some overlap hmm. yeah. and i think that's a good in both there's a good that's a good point too because in larger systems uh like i'll just point out to richmond again there are a lot of people doing building management type work right now that are not librarians um yeah that are part of the admin team um, that are not library people. And also some of their tech people do most actually, are you the only tech person with a library degree, Nan? Because yes, Joe am. and Linda don't have library degrees. No, they yeah. Don't. They just um, have like 20 years of experience. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. um, and they're invaluable. Uh, you know, you guys know that there are always people in libraries who like have all the institutional knowledge. Uh, like another one of them in Richmond is is Lynn, right? Lynn's 45 years or something. Lynn knows where every died this week. Just, uh, oh no. Okay. So she knows where she knew where all the clipping files were for all the like newspaper articles. Like, like she could find them with her eyes closed, but she's not a like she's not a librarian. Um, so it's nice to hear that they are doing those alternate route type things because there are people like that that have invaluable knowledge that definitely should be compensated and given more um uh, uh, authority and uh, you know uh more uh autonomy in their positions that just happen to not have the degree but yes I, I guess depending on the institution uh there are ways to to make it in library world without a library degree um moving this is kind of a bridge to the next question that Lori submitted what skills are critical to success in the library field we've talked about a, a lot of those so far but if there's any others that come to mind um, I think flexibility would be the one that I would, um, and the the willingness to say yes, make yourself available to try as many things as you can. And positivity. I oh mean, yeah, we talk about that. But coming to work in a spirit of positivity, and and what I like to say to people is giving everybody from the patrons to your coworkers the benefit of the doubt, and um, it just creates a better. Um, a better background for you to grow. Um, so instead of saying, oh, I have to do something, say, I get to do this, even if it's bad. And even if it's something that you don't want to do, I, if you approach your career with, oh, I get to do this every day, or I get to do this special project or this annoying project, because I'm <laughs> going to learn something from it. Because I think we can all agree that the, even the worst experiences that you have at your job, you are going to take away something from that. And you can take that take that thing and turn it into a positive. So it seems sort of hokey, but I really do believe that positivity is a, one of the most important things that you can bring to your career. Right. And just assume that everyone that you come across has had a really bad day and you're going to be the best part of their day. So do your best to at least start with that and <laughs> see you could try to um be positive in your interactions with other people but yeah positivity I just is read a, big a book one. that I just read a book that said um wouldn't it be nice if everybody could just wear their damage or their baggage on a on a board around their neck so we can so see it <laughs> yeah. you know what their what their baggage is what their damage is and you can you can be you 
treat them with grace and kindness. So yeah, remember everybody is carrying something. Yeah. I think yeah, in terms of hard skills, the customer service. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And, and and that doesn't just mean with customers; it means with your coworkers 100%. and the people above 100%. and below above and below you in the organization too. Because um, I we've all worked with people who great give great external customer service they're fabulous with customers they always have a smile they're great and they'll turn around to their coworker and they'll be like not as friendly which is not helpful to the organization so customer service internal external up down left right in all directions 360 good customer service yeah nan have any uh um, just wanted to add that I think you have to be the person coming up with the solutions and not just the person who complains about the problem. I think that's a good way to grow is when you say, hey, I see this is a problem. What do you think about trying this way or that way? Because a lot of people, I see a lot of staff who would just like to complain. And I think then people say, oh, they don't, the director never listens to me. The assistant director never listens to me. It's it's not about the complaint. It's what they want is a solution to the problem. They see the same problem too. But if you can come up to them with a solution, I think more people are willing to listen to you and treat you with respect and find this is a good opportunity to grow. When they see that you can find so solutions, I think it really helps you see as a potential manager. So they see you and they see the potential for growth in you. I would. That's so, a great point. So good. Mm -hmm. I would add that, and I've said this um, at the supervisor trainings, we are a pr people profession. We are a people profession. <laughs> like we are the books. Yes, we are stewards of resources that the public has entrusted to us. But our job is, and that's the kind of people we need to be recruiting into the field. Um, this public service is um, a deeply rewarding and deeply, it, it's, a, it's not without its challenges, right? We're on the front lines, we're dealing with all kinds of complex social issues because our, you know, the infrastructure for providing social supports has been eroded the last few decades, right? I'll just say the ugly stuff. And so the library is like the last remaining place holding them and there's tremendous challenges and we shouldn't be shying away from that, right? Because we are open to all and we mm -hmm. serve everyone. So I, that's what I see is like everyone said, being helpful, being curious, customer service over and over. What does that mean though? Is that like Tara said, thinking you're going to be the best person to highlight in that person's day and to be helpful. Um, and compassion. Yeah, because Compl like Jenny said, people are coming from really complex and sad circumstances, a lot of not just the public, your employees too, or your coworkers. So it's been a tough few years for everybody. It's um, not going to get easier. I'll just say that it's yeah. not going to get easier, you know, with accelerating technology and huge gaps in our digital divide, right? Or we don't have a national in, uh, Ethernet backbone for everyone to have equal opportunities to this, you know? So I think... Um, it's, obviously, the people here in our panel, we, we, I'm so, I just personally have learned so much from everyone here, and I, I, I'll stop talking too, because we should open up to questions, right? Right. So, what we, I think would be the easiest way, Jenny, is if you have a question, would you maybe put it in the chat box, right, Jenny, and then we could kind of track them that way. So, if you're an audience member and you have a question, if it's for a particular panelist, you can include their name. If it's just a general question. Um, you could just type it and I'll just give folks a moment or two to start with that. Um, if, and you rather, means, if you rather ask anonymously, which is totally cool, you can just DM uh, myself. Yep. Darlene, I'll ask it on behalf and I won't name you. I, I get that. Uh, and in the meantime, thank you all panelists and thank you also everyone who's attending today. We've gotten some great stories and great questions and answers. So we'll just see. I, I don't believe that none of you guys have questions. So I hope some of you are typing in here. <laughs> really, folks? Okay, I got a question. I'll ask on okay, behalf. Great. This is a great question. 
What advice does a panel have about the low salaries in libraries? Uh, I, the question, the person asking the question, work full time as a librarian can barely support just myself. Mm -hmm. And we have a second question from Christina that we'll get to after that. Um, so the panel that wants to hazard an answer to this million dollar question. I, I'll just say, I think, unfortunately, sometimes the most important jobs are very underpaid. I have a friend who's a social worker who worked on Rikers Island who made less than $40,000 a year. Um, she works at a hospital now and makes a little bit more than that, but we all know teachers, right? Terribly underpaid for what they deal with. And unfortunately, I think this is one of those professions where um, we are not necessarily paid our worth. And it's a tricky position for library management. I'll say that as a director, that our budgets have been compressed. I wish I could pay people more than I'm paying them, but you know, we have finite resources and we're organizations that only spend money. We're not making profit anywhere. So it's a tricky, it's a tricky thing. Um, there are ways to make more money working in libraries. And I would say that's in management and administration, if that's something you're interested in. But unfortunately, a lot of the positions are underpaid. I don't know if anyone else says, go ahead, Amanda. Um, I think there are ways to supplement that, you know, I mean, it, it requires time. Um, mm -hmm. I've been fortunate enough that I, um, you know, once I graduated library school and started working full time, it, I haven't had to do this, but I have looked into it from interest, which is like grant writing. Um, I do have colleagues who supplement with um, weekends at other libraries because we all know how we need, um, you know, help on weekends and evenings as subs. Um, there are often jobs posted on buckles and on library websites on township websites. Um, so I would look there if you have the ability to take on another another part part time job on top of the full time work. I mean, I think it is uh, townships and libraries are hamstrung and um, to the extent that you can make a livable wage. Um, I had somebody, I was in kind of a rut at one point and really just saying, you know, I'm doing all of this great work and I don't, I don't get compensated for it. And I was at a workshop and uh, another woman said to me, you know, you're kind of like a badass. <laughs> she was like, don't let your salary define you. And um, so I think, you know, apart from obviously the livable wage piece. I think sometimes we can get chips on our shoulders. Um, I know I've been in that situation. Um, it can be hard, but um, there are ways to supplement if you love what you do. If you're not enjoying it, then definitely I would say um, keep your eyes open. I I think that's great advice, especially like you can join the, the Buckles job pool if there isn't a specific part-time job. Um, I also want to mention that we're in one of the highest cost of living areas in the country, and I have friends in lots of fields that are having a hard time meeting their, their rent and their, I mean, it's just the cost of living here is like four times the national average. Um, I had a much lower salary in Virginia and had much more disposable income. So I think part of the, part of living in North Jersey too, is just like, this is a, the cost of living reflects the quality of life here. Um, no offense, Nan, I love Richmond forever, you know, but it's, uh, we have really great schools, really great medical right near New York City, and we're paying for that, unfortunately. And it's just like, it's just tough, you know, it's a, it's, this is, you gotta hustle a little bit to live here, unfortunately, but, um, but thank you for those suggestions as far as like side gigs and extra part-time work. Um, we have a few more questions and I wanna keep it moving. Um, Christina had a question specifically for Nan. Um, she wanted to know what your day looks like, Nan. And I know that your days vary, but maybe just give some examples of things that you do in any given day that would be helpful. Um, the best thing, best advice I can say is be prepared for change. Because you think you're coming in, you're going to deal with this vendor, you're going to do some procurement. I have my schedule planned, but things break down in the library system. So then that takes priority. So you have to be a person that's comfortable with change in your schedule. 
um, be prepared to be thrown things. And um, I will tell you, staff is mostly not happy with you. So be, be, be ready for that because you cannot get them what they need when they need it. Um, this, we work, we, the library is part of the city. So how we work is we don't have autonomy on ordering things. It has to go through procurement system or get approval by the main IT uh, Department of Information Technology. So we have a lot of, we are bogged down in paperwork. So it takes anywhere from six months um, to eight months to get things done if it's more than $10,000. So it all depends on what you want. If it's something minor, we can get you that, get that sorted. But we are currently working on getting, replacing all our AWE computers. And that's a big budget item. So we're having a tough time getting through, getting it through procurement because it's all source. So, um, and I think the second part of the question was what training? Mm -hmm. um, the training I think is you need a basic knowledge of how technology works. So you can take, um, do like certifications if you like. I personally don't have any certifications. Everything I learned is learned on the job. Um, and um, if you are not comfortable with technology, I would pursue, Microsoft has a lot of certifications. Google has a lot of certifications. So um, you could go do those basic trainings and then work your way in the library. What, how I learned was offering to help out because we did not have a person, technology person. So me and my colleagues were like, how can we help you, Scott? How can we help do this? So we literally worked on servers. I had no clue how to do anything. He had paperwork. He said, it's already broken, can get worse. So <laughs> go play with it, figure it out. There's somebody who's had this problem. So be, do not be afraid to play with things. Technology feels very complicated, but somebody out in the world has done it. Somebody has had that issue. So do your research with all librarians or we work in library systems so we know how to find things. Somebody has done this before. So you always, you have to just do the, your research and find the person who's done it and you can get a ton of information from there. Right. What do we say? Case, copy and steal everything. No reason to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. And um, I just uh, I just want to mention, so like I said earlier, the Richmond Public Library is not part of a consortium, so it's a little different than Buckles. They don't like lease equipment through a consortium like we do, well, many of us do here. Um, so NAN works directly with the city of Richmond's uh, procurement, so purchasing and then IT to get technology like hardware purchased for the libraries, but she also will troubleshoot at various locations when there's an issue with technology, everything from like print release stations to actual labs, computers gets laptops for the branches, right, Nan? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, right. So Any new would... technology that we want to implement, it has to go through us. So my, right. my job is coming up to our director and say, hey, we want to do this. We recently implemented um, new scanners, which did digital faxes we did not have. And faxing is a big um, ticket mm -hmm. item in Richmond. A lot of our, there's a big demand for faxes and faxes are so expensive. And those are the people who need it to be free. People who are sending in their timesheets and stuff don't need to be paying 50 cents a page. So that's something that we wanted to implement, but it was, we had to write grants. So I find it, we write grants, we get the money, then we have to get it through the city process. So it took a year to get it done, but um, it, it just feels really good to be able to be make a change in people's lives. Right, find a solution for the public. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you for that. That was a great question. Um, we've had, I think, Jenny, you have a couple of anonymous ones, right? Did I you? Have... Yeah, okay. I wanted to ask on behalf of uh, the participants here. So I'll ask the first uh, one. I am a children's librarian, but I want to switch over to reference slash adult services. All of my experiences in children's, so I don't usually hear back when I apply for reference jobs. What can I do to make myself marketable uh, for that type of work? I would say, what, what's your what's in your cover letter too? Because if you just send a resume, all they're going to see is your a list of experience, right? And maybe not like so. I've always been told, and what I always use my cover letter as is an, uh, it's how you it's how you tell your story and explain um, 
any gaps in experience or any lack of experience or perceived lack of experience. So a lot of times you'll have folks that didn't work for several years either because they were helping, they're raising their family or they were taking care of a family member or they were in school or they had a medical issue or whatever. And if you're, if that's not explained in your cover letter, uh, people may not necessarily see your, they may say this person just decided they didn't want to work in libraries for a while, but that's not it at all. There's usually an explanation. Um, so I would say, explain that in your cover letter. Like, I know you're going to see my experience and it's all you services, but I've really passionate about reference and this is why. And I think that's your opportunity to do that um, before you have a chance to meet the person. But I don't know if any of the panelists have um, further advice than that, Amanda. Of course, Amanda, you're so, you're Hi. on fire today, Amanda. No, I'm, I'm, tell me, tell me to be quiet. I, <laughs> I, um, <laughs> um, I, I, I would say try to pick up shifts if you can. If you're in a if you're in an organization where when somebody is out sick on reference, you can help out on the reference desk. Do that, and then that can go. It may not be able to go on your resume, but you can put it in your cover letter. Like um, I've been developed. I've developed an interest in reference services um, by, and I'm honing my skills on. The desk and also in the buckles pool like if you have the time outside of your current job to pick up shifts at other libraries um yeah you know and i would say the skills are um i i wouldn't i look at a ton of resumes and i wouldn't i wouldn't turn one away just because it was youth services services if i was hiring for adult i just um you know i think um you know highlight the skills that are transferable give your resume a second look over because I'm sure it's it's all there. You just need to punch it out there. That's great. Thank you, Amanda. Um, I Do you want to go with your next anonymous? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I want to make sure we get time. I see some other questions after that too. Yeah, the other um, question is what advice, it's kind of related, would you give to newly graduated students when applying for professional roles, when I have never worked as a librarian, but have worked in Buckles? I mean, I think having worked in Buckles is valuable experience in itself. Um, you just need to find the right place that's willing to give you the opportunity. And honestly, if it's a place that wouldn't give you an opportunity, you probably don't wanna work there anyway. <laughs> that's how I feel about it, but, um, but like, say like, like Amanda said, try to pick up shifts somewhere, shifts somewhere too, if you can, if you can't get the full-time gig right away. Sorry. And I was going to say too is carefully read um, the job descriptions because you can see from a job description what they're looking for and you can play up that in your own uh, Buckles experience. Um, you know, if it requires an MLS, that's just one one box that you have to tick off, but most job descriptions are looking for a particular thing. They're trying to fill some kind of hole. And so you just need to read the job description and fill that hole, I think. I would, that's a great point. I would add to that. That's so key. Um, some of the best staff I've ever hired did not get the experience um, working in a library, but, but say worked, um, as their Sunday school teacher. That showed me that this person could lead, could do instruction, um, this person or a community organizer. Uh, I personally wanted to, after I realized I was terrible at cataloging and I loved doing programming, I could not get the opportunities to run programs in libraries. So I sought them outside of libraries. So I did programming, I ran programming for a local parenting group and we brought in big speakers and I had a budget. Then I got really involved in my kids' school, which I learned a lot about with advocacy and marketing and um, actually crisis management. Yeah. Being the person, being no, being the president of a, a Title I um, high yeah. needs urban PTA, I learned a lot of that. And to your point, I sold that in my cover letter when I was in a final interview with the provost at the college. He asked me what my experience was with politics, and I said. Well, I was elected to be the president of the PTA at Cordero PS37, which is this downtown school. And he said, oh, so you know about politics. I said, yeah, I know about politics. So I love to find, and then one last anecdotal story, before I became a librarian, I, was, I worked in technology. 
And I will never forget the best cover of a letter I ever read was a retired professional ballet dancer. And they retired typically at 28, 29, who was looking to get into tech. And it was a, the perfect cover letter because it showed, he showed me very clearly how his skills, collaborating, discipline, hard work, ability to learn things on the fly, translate directly into a tech support. It was like, it. I was sold. And plus his, he had the attitude, like, I will do what it takes, right? Because that's what you do when you're rehearsing with the dance partner. You stay after hours to work on those moves. When you have to lift someone, I'll never say, I, this is like 20 years ago, I remember this so keenly. And he went on to become the QA manager, fabulous, fabulous staff. So I say for those of you who don't have those relevant skills, find them if you if you don't the time if you don't want a gig find them in something you're already doing whether it's church or your community because those all those skills are directly transferable great great advice thank you we're gonna we're getting down to the last 20 minutes or so so i just want to keep this rolling we have a question for amanda um, Lauren writes, I am in the Rutgers MI school library track program. My plan is to get the school cert um, certificate. So I will have a choice after graduating about working in either a, a school setting or a public library. My experience so far has only been in a public library and your experience, what made you choose public over school? So first I will say when I went to Rutgers, they did not, the certification was not part of your MLIS, even if you were on the education track. So part of it was that when I graduated, I needed to work right away. I had already I had spent my money. I, <laughs> um, I wanted to get right into school. Is it still the same? You have to do the certification separately? Hi, I can jump in if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we finished all the requirements of the certification as part of the degree program, and then you apply as you're graduating. So I'll be prepared to get the certificate right as I'm graduating. Oh, that's great. That's totally different than when I went. So when I went through, I think part of it for me was that I had to go, I had to do the certification separately. So I got a job in a private school where I didn't need the New Jersey certification. And um, I, it wasn't really a good fit from the beginning. And I kind of knew that, um, but then I got pregnant. <laughs> and so um, it was sort of like, well, do I continue at this private school or do I go back and get my certification and find a job in a public school? And then we figured out a way for me to stay home um, and for a little while. And so I think if I had been in a school that was a better fit, perhaps even um, a middle school or a high school, my I may have wound up doing something totally different. I really did not love, for me, the elementary school environment and especially when I went back after I had my son, I was dropping him off at daycare at seven in the morning to go read to other people's kids. I mean, there was more to it than that, of course. I know we all cringe when people say, oh, you get to read books all day, you're a librarian. There was more to it, of course, but ultimately it just wasn't a good fit for me or my family. In addition to that, I really did miss being with adults and collaborating throughout the day. And um, that was something that even at a very, very part-time level, I had right away in public librarianship. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't feel like um, being in a private school, at least, there wasn't, there wasn't a whole lot of mentorship in the private, in the school environment. And right out of library school, having not really, having only worked minimally um, in libraries, it, it I, did, I was really floundering. Um, so being in a public setting where I could ask a lot of questions and people were ready to answer and, and weren't like, well, I got, I got my own prep to do. I can't talk to you about that right now, you know? And, and I also liked the flexibility. Um, 
So it was, it was more, I would say more personal, than, but I'm happy to talk more offline at any point if you'd like to reach out. Hi Lauren, I would like to jump in uh, because I saw your question and I'm a certified media specialist and a public librarian and I'm a library director for the last three years. Um, my background was I was a high school teacher when I was in India and when I moved here, I was still working in an elementary school and be, as a substitute teacher and meanwhile I was working on my MLIS. So I went back as a media specialist um, and I worked I worked part-time in a public library and I was a full-time school media specialist because I wanted to figure out what I want to do with my career. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed working in the public library. I, I hated my one year between two schools media specialist. I was pushed from one school to the other. I worked in the Persephone School District where I live currently. Um, and um, I was short of one certification and I, I could become a media specialist. The school provided the money and I took an online class and I do have a certification. But personally, like how uh, Amanda mentioned, I did not enjoy my experience being a school media specialist. Um, there was nobody to uh, talk to. There was no questions answered. I was a first year media specialist. All the teachers thought they had a free um, babysitter for that 40 minutes of class, whereas the, the rule required was the class teacher was supposed to be with you. And at the end of the school year, I found out I was pregnant with the, my twins. So again, a strong reason that I did not want to work at school. I came back to public library. I worked as a um, at adult services librarian. I was a technology librarian for my consortium, uh, similar what um, you know Padma did. And then uh, finally, I moved up to be a director. So you can get the certification. You have that option open, but I would highly recommend working part-time because there are many schools that are offering part-time media specialist position and see if that's something you would like. Yeah, and I would say um, I started at a private school, likewise went to public because it paid a lot better. And it differs grades, right? Because then I worked from elementary, middle, and high school. And high school, when you have the open library, it's a much different experience than elementary, which I still say to this day, elementary school librarians are the hardest working librarians like ever, right? Mm -hmm. Schools, and you have to run the library, and you have to do PD. It's insane. 100%. So I quickly moved. I went up to, I loved working in the high school, and I missed it. And the reason why, I, I would have stayed actually, because I love, to this day, I'm like, I love the faculty. I came into work every day laughing. I left because of the financial reasons. You know, I got this opportunity to go into academic, be a dean, and it doubled my salary. I still miss that high school environment and the faculty. So it's it depends on your district, right? I worked in two different districts, two very different experiences, two different age groups. Um, so yeah, Brenda's advice is very is wise and sage. Try them all because you won't know it until you you're in it. Um, but that's been my experience. Thank you, everyone. Um, someone asked about the salary survey. If you email me anyone, I will send it to you. Um, if your director won't, they should. But if they won't, or you don't feel comfortable asking, feel free to email me. Um, question for Maria. You mentioned working as a facility manager on top of all of your other responsibilities. How did you come into that role and how does it tie in with your day-to-day? -day? I feel like Maria invented that role for herself by solving problems, but I could be wrong, Maria. You no, you're right. <laughs> you are actually hundred percent correct. That's what it was. Um, tr truthfully, you know, I could only walk into a building so many times and see, you know, like the toilet like leaking or you know the soap dispensers out of uh whatever or why is that light bulb flickering for the past whatever you know i couldn't it's just something that i like to be able to present to our public the the best atmosphere that they can walk into um and that all has to do with customer service as well so you're right tara i totally kind of created that on my own and obviously stephanie would have done that uh, but, you know, we have to understand as well that our directors are super busy doing a lot of other behind the scenes work that we may not realize until we actually work hand in hand with them. And then we realize, oh, OK, that's what's going on back there. And so unless you present it and say, hey, I noticed that this I just took it upon myself to call this electrician, or do we have a certain vendor we have to use? You know, you can go to your director and say, do we have to use this electrician or that electrician? There are three light bulbs that have been flickering. Are we going to change over 
you know, are we leaving these bulbs in? Are we going to go to LED? What are we doing? So I just basically created, um, I by finding the problems and solving the problems, it just sort of led me into making sure that the whole, it, it was almost a little bit of a joke because she was like, well, you're doing a good job at this. And, you know, like you just created this for yourself. So here's a new job for you. Um, but I will be, tr I will be truthful, Douglas, that it, it's a, it's a lot of work to do my day-to-day -day tasks um, of being, I have direct, um, the head of, uh, head of circulation, the adult services supervisor, the young adult um, supervisor, the children's, they all report to me. I, have to, I deal with them as well as the facilities management. And so a lot of times, like for instance, yesterday I worked um, from, from home, uh, which was a, I don't do that very often, but that is a lovely thing of having that flexibility in the management world. Whereas if I'm at the CERC desk, I have to be at the CERC desk. Um, but I had somebody call me up and say, one of my coworkers called me up and said, the copy machine is giving me um, an error code. It's not spitting out change. What should we do? So I have literally, I carry with me everywhere I go, a, rock, um, a list of all the phone numbers of every, any, Thing that might go on in our facility, I carry that with me. And so I was able to call Document Solutions up. That's the company we use. Called them up and said, are you able to get a, a service tech out here right away? First, I said, can you walk me through it? And I will try and just troubleshoot it on the phone. They weren't able to do that. They'd send somebody out. And we took care of it within a few hours, luckily. But it's a lot. So I, I don't know if I can, um, if that's, I, I don't <laughs> want to lie about it. <laughs> that's just the truth of it, that it is a lot to juggle. Um, with the day to day, but I love it. So I do it. It's, it doesn't feel like work. Thanks Maria. The, re the, the reward for hard work is always more work, right? Hard yeah. and good work gets you more work. Yeah. Um, I, I appreciate everyone's time. We're, we're getting to the end of our time now. So I just wanted to say thank you again to all of our panelists for participating today. Um, if you're willing panelists, if you wouldn't mind, it's totally optional, but if you want to share your email address in the chat, if people have follow-up questions for you, if you're willing to do that, that would be great. <clears throat> um, Jenny and I are also always available to you to answer any questions that you may have. Although Jenny is like the busiest woman alive and I feel like sometimes I'm like close to her ranking of busiest woman alive. So if it takes me a day or two to get back to, I apologize. But if you do, um, I'm putting mine in there right now too. If, um, or I just sent it to Jenny and instead of everyone, cause that's, I haven't had enough coffee today, but here we go. Now I'm gonna send it to everyone. Um, but if anyone had further questions for Jenny or myself, we'd be more than happy to uh, answer them for you. And thanks, Nan. If anyone has questions about Virginia Public Libraries, I'm sure Nan can answer those as well. Um, and if you are not comfortable asking your director for the salary survey, I'm happy to share it with you. It's all, please, I just wanna remind everyone that's all public information. Um, what's in the salary survey and it is a helpful tool. It's also just really interesting to see how li other libraries are structured, like what sort of staff they have. And um, yeah, I, I find it fascinating. It's a great document. There's really nothing like that anywhere else. That's something that Buckles prepares on behalf um, of its members to help their directors staff their libraries properly and make sure um, that we're doing a good job in fairness and offering the right PTO and salaries that we should be um, and that we're comparable with our, our neighboring libraries. It's a really wonderful tool. So we're, we're glad to have it and it is um, great information. Um, but thank you again, everyone for coming today. This was a through panelists. You all did a great job telling your story and answering these questions. Um, Darlene, thank you for all the tech and keeping us on task. Jenny, thank you so much for keeping me from rambling too much. I don't know if you have any inspiring parting words to share with everyone. <clears throat> No. Okay. <laughs> so I think we're at this point, we're going to be wrap helpful. Up. Be helpful. Yes, solve. Be helpful. Be open. Solve be problems. Be a problem <laughs> solver. Um, I just want to remind everyone that you are going to receive an evaluation for today. It really, really helps us to put events like this together. If we have um, evaluations and feedback, as far as the structure or lack thereof, or what you're looking for more of or less of, if you could please complete it right away, but definitely by the end of the week, also, Darlene will be sending a follow-up email with, she just said, with the um, participants' emails in it. <clears throat> this is also going to be recorded. <clears throat> I swear this is pollen and not any sort of disease. It's just like, this is a rough time right now, man. So if you could please look for the evaluation and complete it as soon as possible, um, definitely by the end of this week. And also this link of the recording will be shared as well. So if you have coworkers, 
um, that are interested in maybe what we discussed today, uh, please make sure that you uh, share that link with them. But thank you everyone so much for coming. Uh, a lot of folks asked about networking events. There are tons of member services networking events. And also I encourage everyone that's interested to join a committee or a task force. Um, come to system council, ask your director if you can go to system council. I find system council super interesting. Watch the EB meetings if you're interested in that too. Um, attend your own board meeting as well. It's a great way to learn more about your library. Um, but thank you all so much for coming. I hope you have a great rest of the week. Thank you in advance for doing the evaluation. Jenny, thank you. My co-chair, amazing oh. partner. Um, I'm just going to ask all the panelists to hang out for a minute after everybody leaves just so we can say goodbye. Um, but everyone else, you're free to go. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your Tuesday. Thanks for joining us. Stay dry. Bye. Yeah, it is raining. Huh? I will stop the recording.